one, your chances to get the grant might improve if you're well into the limit. Now, ask for everything you need. If you need $12,000, ask for $12,000. But I could have asked for $12,000, and I only asked for $7,000 some. And my ratings were very good, very good, good. I didn't even get an excellent, and I still got the grant. And I wonder if that was probably because, you know, as $7,000 is a fortune to a grad student, they thought, oh, we've got this thing around, let's throw it at her. Um, make sure to get someone in the DSR. I had Linda Isaacs do this for me to check my budget because things go in different categories and I put them where they make sense to me and I had everything in the wrong category. And she said, no, this goes in part A, this goes in part B. And yeah, I had done everything wrong. So make sure somebody in the DSR checks it over for you. And yeah, I'm happy to take emails on this or if you have any comments on things you wish I had talked about, talked about if I were to do this again. That's it. Let's go through your proposal. Let's sign.
received NSF grants. I've sponsored students that have gotten NSF grants. But more importantly, I've been on five DEIG panels. So I know I've reviewed a lot of proposals. So I have a good idea of what you should and shouldn't do. Um, so I just did a stream of consciousness thing a few days ago. And there's a bunch of points. And you might want to go through them. I've actually sent this to a program officer at NSF who's looked at them to make sure they're appropriate. She added a few things. Uh, so this is, uh, I think there's some useful stuff here. And this is going to overlap with, I think, what Connie's going to talk about. So that's how we'll work it out. A couple points about, uh, so I've arranged this into three things. The process at UF, um, what actually happens at an NSF panel, and then just some points about writing a proposal. So um, just a couple things about what happens on campus. IRBs, that usually confuses people. You don't need to submit and have the IRB approved when you submit the proposal. You can do IRB pending, but you won't get the money if you don't have IRB approval. So you have between the time that your proposal is awarded and you need to get the money, you've got to have IRB approval. The money cannot be received and distributed without that. Um, but you don't want to overburden the IRB having to do approvals on things that aren't going to get funded. So even on senior grants, people will submit proposals with IRB pending. Um, you uh, have to get approved what your department, you need to know what that's about. Your department is responsible budgetarily for you. So usually your department, um, your committee and your committee chair reviews the science, but the department is usually reviewing the budget. They need to make sure that that all makes sense. They're not reviewing the science. So you may get a deadline from your department that is way before the deadline. That's because they want to have time to review the budget and then submit it to DSR. But you can actually put the text of your proposal up on Fastlane, which is the NS NSF site, and make modifications to that text right up to a few days before. So don't think that, uh, for example, I've heard of a deadline of the 4th or the 15th. The 4th is just when the department wants to have the budget in order. So they're going to want to have a draft with the whole packet, but you can still make modifications to the and that's going to be really important because you'll find yourself up to the last minute making modifications. Uh, so that's what happens here uh, at NSF. Um, so there's different programs at NSF, which you've seen from the website. You can have a proposal co-reviewed. Okay? So you can request, for example, to have a proposal reviewed by cultural anthropology and linguistics. That is to your benefit in some circumstances. If the proposal fits both programs, it makes sense. Be very careful if you're submitting and you're writing a proposal for two programs that are very different and you don't actually make it sound like it belongs anywhere. So for example, I've had students who are in departments um, that are kind of interdisciplinary and they have trouble because they don't appear like they have a home. So you've got to make sure that it fits in at least one of these programs. Um, the times that it really makes sense is for programs that have a, a very high funding rate. So for example, cultural anthropology, <laughs> gets a lot of proposals and has very little money. Other programs get very few proposals and have a lot of money. So it helps you if you submit to two programs, particularly if there's one that's going to fund a lot of proposals. If the, the amount of money the program receives is not a function of the number of proposals it gets. Okay? But unfortunately, you won't know that until after the fact. So you, you are encouraged to do co-review. Be aware if you do that, different programs have different page limits different deadlines, different budget amounts. The ones that apply is the first one that's listed on your grant. Okay? So you want to be careful which one you list first. And you can talk to the program officers about that, and they'll give you a lot of advice. Okay. So what actually happens? So you submit your proposal. Um, the program officer gets your proposal and all the other proposals. They put them in a spreadsheet. They get. Uh, uh, they then send those out to the um, panelists. So each panel usually, for, for example, for anthropology, usually has around 15 people, something like that. Depends. In, this, in anthropology, it's 15 because there's a lot of proposals. So there's 15 people. They've got to take, let's say, 120, 130 proposals and divide those up among 15 people. So each person is going to read three proposals entirely. And they're going to do a review on it, and they're going to give it a grade. And the grade will be excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. Okay? Each of those three reviewers sends those back. The program officer uh, 
assembles them, so each proposal will have been reviewed by at least three people. But don't think that everybody on that panel is going to read your proposal. That is not the case. It's too much. There's 120 of them in some cases. So on a, on a panel that has a lot of proposals, they're only going to read the ones that are assigned, guaranteed, and then maybe some that interest them. So that is put together, and then the program officer orders them, and then in some programs, they'll try and actually when the panel comes together, and it's a two-day panel, they'll try and have uh, discuss all the proposals. But if there's a lot of proposals, it's not possible. So some programs will triage. What triage means is that if you don't at least get one very good, for example, it will not be discussed at the panel. You'll still get your three reviews. You'll still get a panel summary, but that will have been put together from the three reviews. So you'll always get feedback from those three reviewers, but you can't be guaranteed that your proposal will get discussed. So you want to at least get one very good so that it gets discussed. Okay? So uh, let's see. Uh, reviewers, do not expect that on that panel there is going to be somebody who is an expert in your field, um, particularly in a field like anthropology that's fairly broad they're handling a lot of things. So there, it's unlikely that there's going to be somebody who's an expert in your field, although there might be. So you're well advised not, I think that was really good advice, you're well advised to write your proposal so that a motivated undergraduate could understand it. Don't use a lot of dark jargon. Use a lot of jargon, you're going to lose people and you'll irritate them. Don't ever irritate reviewers. Okay. The advice of getting right to the point is a really good one. I shouldn't have to wait two pages um, before figuring out what your proposal is about. Okay. So um, what happens, you know, we're back at the panel, um, we're all sitting there, and the first proposal comes up. It's got at least one very good. The way it usually works is the person who gave it the highest rating then presents it to the rest of the panel, and they present the case for the proposal. Then the person who's second highest goes next, and then the person who gave it the lowest score uh, goes third. And if you get three excellence, usually there won't be much discussion. You'll just get it. And three excellence is, is obviously good. Um, if you've got, uh, uh, the most discussion comes when you've got an excellent and a good and a poor, or some situation like that. In that case, there's going to be an awful lot of discussion about what to do with it. And it can go on for a very long time. So it'll be talked about, and eventually, um, people who have not actually read your proposal have an interactive system and they can pull it up and they can look at each of the reviews and they can actually look at your proposal. So while the discussion is going on, they're actually reading through it and if they know something about it, they'll chime in. And so that whole process goes on until there's essentially some consensus about what to do. And then your proposal gets uh, placed into one of five categories. The top one, they differ by program, but essentially the top one is we've got to fund this. And the second one is, we really ought to fund this. And the third one is, we'll fund this if we've got enough money. And that's really what ends up happening. So um, fourth is revise and resubmit, and fifth is decline. Even if you get a five, you can resubmit, and you should. I can tell you as a reviewer, people look very favorably on a proposal that's been resubmitted. And particularly, only if you've actually addressed the critiques. But if you do, people really want to try and get you funded. And I, I don't know that I agree with uh, the notion that people are looking for reasons not to read. I don't think that that's true. Um, but I, I, I do think um, you're, you're strongly encouraged to resubmit. The program officer I just talked to said she just funded something that um, was submitted for the fourth time. So perseverance pays off. Okay, so proposals have now been uh, graded. We all leave. It's now sitting with the program officer. The program officer has a budget. Uh, has to figure out how many proposals can be funded and starts at the top uh, and usually uh, has some sort of cutoff. I can fund this many. Two things to know. The program officer is not bound to take the recommendations of the panel. The program officer uses that as guidance and they usually follow up pretty closely. But sometimes the program officer really likes something and has the authority to pull it up and fund it. Okay? That doesn't help you much but you should know that that actually happened. Uh, when they're figuring out what to fund, when they get down to the edges, they are going to look at the budget because they may find that, well, if I ask this many people to give back $1,000, I can fund another proposal. 
So usually you're going to be asked to give some money back, unless you're in a program that really doesn't have a lot of proposals, and you might not be, but usually people are. If you get funding from another source, almost certainly you're going to be asked to. So if you get a Fulbright and an NSF proposal, they're going to want you to give back some of your budget so that you can help fund other people. Okay? So um, you'll find out, gosh, what is it? What was it? For how many, how long after you submitted? Uh, submitted in July, and I got word here in September. Right. So it's a long time. And once you get word that you get it, it can be another two to three months before the money actually gets here and you can spend it. So you have to think about that timing. If you're resubmitting and you're uh, somebody who's doing field work and you went ahead and started your field work and you're now resubmitting and you're already doing some sort of data collection, you've got to reflect that in your new proposal. You've got to tell people how you're going to go about spending that money. Uh, budget justification is where you can explain what you're going to do with the money. And uh, that is a really good place for you to sort of do some extra work telling them um, how good your proposal is. You can use the budget justification to your advantage as a way of demonstrating what the proposal is about. So at this point, you should kind of know how it works. A lot of people are surprised that uh, they're not getting reviews back from people that seem like they know what your work is about. That's true, almost certainly. You may be lucky and get one. So you are well served to write your proposal so that it can be understood. Don't write your proposal. Uh, making your proposal difficult to understand does not make you sound smart. It will almost certainly make sure that you won't get funded. I'm reading 20 proposals. I have a month and a half to do it. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out something that I don't know what somebody's doing. So be very straightforward. Okay? How much time do I have? I think you're done. Am I? <laughs> I have to take, say two more things. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Great. Um, there are some things to avoid. I really don't like it when somebody uses the word gap or lacuna. <laughs> or, uh, so you, if you're going to, don't, don't point to a gap in the field as a reason for doing your work. Because you're gonna just, it's gonna be your luck that you'll get a reviewer that has done work in your area and they're gonna get ticked off. Because basically you're saying that all of their work is, is, isn't up to muster. It happens all the time. So I've never seen anybody that's well served by saying, I'm doing my research because there's this huge gaping gap in the field. Lacuna is a fancy way of saying gap. Um, don't use the words, I will show that. Um, you've already done the work. It's not science, okay? It is the National Science Foundation. So the whole thing needs to be presented like it's a question. If you've already come to conclusions, nobody wants to fund it. There has to be questions. Ideally, you'll have hypotheses, and ideally those hypotheses won't be obvious, and uh, we'll have alternative hypotheses, okay? So don't, uh, uh, you know, hypothesis, and you should be okay if the work doesn't 